today there is a burden to teach there is a burden so i have a reflection that you can call it teaching and i i trust that in the name of jesus this will help you i i give a reflection on christmas celebrations on three points today historical soteriological or if you like spiritual and the tradition which is remembrance so three points the historical and when i talk about historical looking at the bible and a, gl a, gl a glimpse of the secular history that's history beyond the bible what we could call extra biblical history my interest is not to go into any detail my interest is just to make reference to put things together for understanding so go historical go soteriological which is spiritual the spiritual dimension of it and the tradition which is remembrance let's look at the first text in luke's gospel chapter 2 the first text in luke's gospel chapter 2 from verse 1 to 7 our, what we are trying to answer as a question in this text and moving forward is do we really know the exact date of Christmas? Do we know the exact date of Christmas? Can we truly say that the 25th of December is truly the day that Christ was born? That is a very important and very relevant question. Before we go into the scripture, I will say, no, we can't say. I'm not sure anybody in this world right now can say with specific details and with sureness and certainty the exact date that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born. So in talking about the historical dimensions of Christmas, the aim is not to fix a date. The day, the issue is not about dates. Let's look at, let's look at Luke's Gospel, chapter two. Luke's Gospel, chapter two, verse one to seven. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar, from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. Now, this is history. If you study the history of the Roman Empire, you will know that Caesar Augustus is a historical figure, one of the Caesars that ruled the Roman Empire. So in this case, if we are to go into the archives of the Roman Empire and trace to the time of Caesar Augustus and then pin down to the time of the census or one of the times that he, he, re, he declared that people should be registered if there was more than once. In that case, they could have a tentative understanding of what time of the year was Christmas. But in terms of specific, it will still be almost impossible. So historically, we can see that there are names that in extra biblical history are uh, in the picture and with that we know we are dealing with what is authentic because if you study the history of the roman empire like i've said you will meet caesar augustus okay so we take that luke's gospel chapter 2 and verse 1 again and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from caesar augustus that all the world should be registered Verse 2, this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Another historical issue here. So, in the history or in the archive of the Roman Empire, we we'll know of the governor Quirinius over Syria as at that time. So, all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Verse 4, Joseph also went. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He was of the house and lineage of David. So, 
So we're still dealing with history here. And we know that Mary and Joseph existed and operated and were used by God in the time of Caesar Augustus and Quirinius as the governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went, verse 5. Verse 5, he went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with a child. So it was that while they were there, while they were there, this scripture is talking about time, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. The day the days were completed for her to be delivered while they were there so we are still dealing with time and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in the swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn so there is an explanation why there was no room for them in the inn in the motel hotel guest house whatever you call because there was there was influx of people in the city and they were not privileged to have accommodation amidst this struggling for people to be accommodated and so that was the time that jesus was born what the scripture has not told us about the birth of jesus is the specificity in terms of the the, the period the time the season of the year but historically the connections are there so which means it is established that jesus was born in a particular time within the context of extra biblical hist historical figures like augustus caesar and quirinius now so that has been settled that issue of the exact date of christmas the exact date of the birth of jesus which we can call authentically the date of christmas that one is not settled nor is that the issue when it comes to christmas the, that's not the main issue and it may interest you and i will request that you do some personal stories yourself that the eastern orthodox churches the eastern catholic churches they have a different arrangement in terms of dates for christmas in terms of dates different so if you go to Ukraine, Ukraine is in the news with Russia, um, but they also give us opportunity to have insight into the Eastern Orthodox Church. Between the 7th century and the 10th century, a lot of misunderstanding between the, the Western part of the Roman Empire and the Eastern part of the Roman Empire that eventually led to what is called schism the first and major schism in history of the church that now brings about the eastern churches and the roman church from which we have our own understanding of christianity in the western world the eastern churches up to the coptic church in egypt these are eastern you know the eastern block and they have a different date for christmas which means even in the body of christ in the western and the eastern there is disparity in terms of the date of Christmas, which means when we celebrate Christmas, it is not the date that matters. And this is very important at this point for you to note that it is not the date that matters in the celebration of Christmas. It is the event. And I want to repeat, it is not the date that matters, but it is the event. Because of so many people stirring controversies, of the relevance of Christmas and the Christmas celebration, people point to the fact that we are not celebrating Christ on the day he was born, so it is useless. It is not the date that makes the Christ. It is the Christ who makes the date. Remember John chapter 1, and from verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things all things he was in the beginning all things were made in verse 3 all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made so he is the maker of time time does not define him he defines time therefore when we are talking about christmas essentially it is not about date 
it is about the event and the event is about the person therefore christianity uh, therefore christmas for christians for believers is not date it is a person it is the event of a person that is the essence of the christ the christian faith that is the foundation of the christian faith that is of is everything everything about the christian faith so we have established historically we cannot say for sure when christ was born in terms of the date in terms of specific time in date and month and year that one is difficult that of the year may be traced because we have augustus caesar and we have quirinius the governor of syria so the year of that census can be traced if we are to go into the archive of the roman empire to search and that is a difficult one and perhaps not impossible okay so the next thing we want to talk about is the relationship between a christmas celebration and paganism the pagan connections so to say the pagan roots of a christmas celebration now let's make this very clear that what we call christmas in itself is a celebration that is originally the replacement of ancient roman pagan festivity or celebration so if we are to look at if we are to look at historically the time that christmas is celebrated in the western part of of our world in the west as opposed to the east i talk about the church both eastern and western so if we are to trace christmas and even to the east and the west the, in terms of the celebration itself there is something historically that makes it the replacement of something that was paganic and the context of this and the foundation of this is the fact that in about the third century um, about 300 years after jesus christ had come and had died a man a constantine emperor constantine went through the process of conversion into christianity in his fight with his rival for the soul of the roman empire for the supremacy who will be the ultimate emperor history has it that of course you have different dimensions and nuances of this history but essentially that in this battle constantine had an encounter had an encounter was the mystery of the christ that told him that in the cross is the salvation and he must have made a vow why i'm speaking not in very specific terms because if you go and look at his history books you have different dimensions but what will be essential is that constantine eventually made a vow that if he will be given victory in the war against his rival that he will convert to christianity well eventually constantine became a christian even though his baptism did not take place until when he was dying but he became a professed christian and began the tax of legitimizing christianity because until emperor constantine christianity was illegal to be a christian was to be deserving of death and that is the origin and the history of the Christian martyrs. Those who were persecuted, we know of Emperor Nero. It must have been about the worst of the, perse uh, the persecutors of the church and others who martyred believers. And believers, when we talk about martyrs, they are witnesses, those who witness to the truth of their faith in Christ unto death. Many of them were sown into if you read the letter to the hebrews a part of it especially in chapter 11 talking about the faith um, makes a lot of reference to people who suffered on account of their faith people were fed to beasts to lions people were burned to death people were killed in various ways for just being christians and they were tormented and asked to renounce their faith and the practice of their faith and they refused and they died for it that was normal so 
Christians lost everything. They did not have right to existence. They did not have right to properties. And this persecution um, varied in terms of intensity depending on which emperor was on the throne. Whether it was an emperor that was sympathetic to Christian be uh, believers or the one that was antagonistic outright. So it was within um, in such climb that Emperor Constantine emerged as the emperor of the Roman Empire. And so he began gradually, first of all, to legitimize, to make Christian faith a legitimate faith, that Christians now had right to serve their God according to their faith and to practice their faith publicly. Until then, the faith was practiced in the night, in caves, in people's homes, people's homes, and in hidden secret places. All right. In the process of this Christian of this legitimization of Christianity, another process also happened simultaneously, which was the Christianization, so to say, of the Roman Empire. I'm still dealing with history of Christmas, the general context with Emperor Constantine. So the Christianization of the Roman Empire meant that Christianity be became the official religion of the Roman Empire. What that meant is that the Christ replaced the different gods, pagan gods of the, the, Roman, the Roman world. Jesus Christ became the Lord, known and recognized and the god and father of our lord jesus christ became the god that was recognized officially officially by the roman empire and in this process of christianization dates seasons festivities and festive seasons were christianized part of which is christmas so christmas originally was a season of celebrating the pagan gods of Rome. But because Christianity had come, the understanding was if Christ is the main, the main savior, the Lord, if this is the real God, then in the place of the celebration of these other gods, where these other gods were given homage to since they are idols and they do not have existence and they are connected to evil, that the Christ, the light of the world, the light of God over the world, should be celebrated. Generically, Christ, Christmas replaces a pagan festival. And this was, it was not only Christmas that had issues of replacing ancient pagan festival. It was a trend in the bid to Christ, Christianize the Roman Empire, whatever that was dedicated to the gods of the pagans, the gods that were demonic, that were not true gods, now had to be replaced by either the time, the celebration, the feast, the honor, and the worship of the true Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, so what that means is that even though Christmas, the implication of this is because you hear those who come from the place of history, the secular people and those who do not have understanding of the faith beyond what is read on the internet or what people talk about or what their friends talk about the understanding that many people now have is oh so christian is a pagan a pagan uh, celebration that has no place in christianity and especially because almost across the world the christmas season becomes one of the holidays that witnesses immorality that witnesses wickedness, that witnesses a sin at the highest level or highest proportion. So the, the misunderstanding and misconception is the linking of the two together or the three together. That Christianity, uh, Christmas replaced pagan ancient religious festival. And there is so much of immorality in it. Therefore, Christmas is not Christian. That is such lame logic, logic that is founded upon ignorance, upon naivety of, um, of sinful proportion if they are shown by those who should know enough to teach. So Christmas 
Okay, before we before I go into the next thing, let's imagine when the white people, when white people came to Africa and came to our land, most of the places that they build schools and build hospitals and churches were places that people will not dare live in. They were places associated either where people were buried, unhabitable people, places that people will not be able to live in security and safety because of the wild demonic activities. But these places were given to the missionaries who came. So, okay, hoping that if they will want to die, let them go and die. But eventually that, those places become where churches, old churches were established, schools were established, and hospitals were established. Will we say that because the churches were established in the places of masquerade, in the places of burial and demon and the pagan rituals and celebration, that the churches that were built there are evil? Or should there be people committing evil in the church? Is there any connection between the two? Or should there be immorality in schools that were built by the missionaries in those strange places? Can we say, okay, let's burn down the school, let's reject the school, we no longer go to that church because the church replaced the shrine or the school replaced shrine or hospitals replaced shrine, you know that it is not true. It is a matter of light conquering darkness. And that is exactly what Christmas was intended originally by the Roman Empire under the reign of Emperor Constantine and those who took over him and continued in his footpath. It was intended that the light of the Christ, whose birth will be celebrated in Christmas, will now replace the darkness of the pagan world, the, pe the darkness of idolatry. Okay, another dimension of the same question is, will we say, because marriages are, are under serious attack and sex has been reduced in its uh, sanctity and value as ordained by God because of the prevalent immorality and the breaking down of marriages and um, all sorts of things happening in the, um, in the institution of marriage. We now talk about same sex and all sorts of things and people no longer believing in, in lasting commitment in marriage but just some kind of concubinage that could be called partnership. Can we then say that marriage is evil because there is so much divorce, there is so much evil, sometimes couples kill um, each other and um, or one another and there is issues of poisoning, issues of court, issues of you know all sorts of things happening and will we then say sex in itself is evil because there is immorality or marriage is evil because the high rate of divorce and the lack of belief among the people of this generation that is the point so what is happening is that the devil takes time out and intensely and intentionally to this to seek to corrupt to seek to corrupt and destroy the righteousness and the true worth and value of what god gives us of the gift of god both in time and in material and should we abandon what god what represents god what is of god because the enemy the devil has attacked it has sought to corrupt it those are the things that you should be able to answer for yourself okay so let's move from the historical to the soteriological when i say to soteriolog soteriological we are talking about the spiritual dimension of it in terms of salvation the word soteria in the new testament greek is salvation everything about the salvation the redemption the atonement so what is the salvi salvation dimension of christmas let's go to isaiah chapter 9 isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 7 isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 to 7 for unto us a child is born Unto, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Pay attention, a child is born, 
unto us a child is given a, a child a child is born unto us a son is given birth means time somebody is, is is born in time somebody is born in time so jesus christ was born in time as a gift pay attention to these two words born in time as a gift unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace this is isaiah's prophecy about jesus the next verse verse 6 says of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of david and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this that's the first scripture what is prominent there is the throne of david his kingship government shall be upon his shoulder the throne of david is mentioned let's go to genesis chapter 49 verse 8 to 10 we still want to make more inquiries about the child that is born and the son that is given genesis chapter 49 and from verse 8 to 10 judah this is prophecy the foretelling of jacob about his fourth child judah judah you are the you are he whom your brothers will or shall praise you are he whom your brothers shall praise judah your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies your father's children shall bow down before you judah is a lion's whelp. from the prey my son you have gone up he bows down he lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all the people. Glory to God. The scripture is talking in prophecy, the foretelling of the destiny of Judah, that his scepter shall not depart until he comes, that to whom it belongs in the future. And Jesus Christ, the child born in time, the son given in time whose birth had been foretold by isaiah and actually came to pass in the time of augustus caesar as the emperor of rome and quirinius the governor of syria it is this jesus who is the fulfillment of the destiny of judah and you know what david is the man of judah from whom the christ came and david is the man who became the first king to fulfill the prophecy that was made by Jacob over Judah. J David became the first king from the tribe of Judah. And the scripture talks about the connection between Jesus and his ancestor and his lineage in David. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. We are still dealing with the soteriology the salvation part of what is celebrated in christmas because that is what matters it is not the date it is what christmas represents matthew chapter 2 verse 1 to 2 now after jesus was born in bethlehem of judea in the days of herod the king so we still talking about the days herod herod who was over judea who was over judea Herod. So we're still dealing with history. So if we go into archive, we'll be able to look at historically what date, what day, what month, what year. That may be impossible or almost impossible to deal with in specific terms, but generically we have historical connection. The scripture says, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? who has been born king of the jews king of the jews this refers to the scepter of judah that was upon david that god had promised david that his kingdom will last forever for we have seen his star in the east and have come 
to worship him. Glory to God. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Why? A king was born. A king was born. A king was seen. A king had been talked about. We are still tracing the soteriological connection of Christmas, the salvation dimension. What is Christmas really about? Revelation chapter 5 from verse 4 to 9. Revelation chapter 5 from verse 4 to 9. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, you see all of this coming together. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the one that Jacob prophesied and spoke of in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 49, that was fulfilled in David rising as the first king, in Judah and then is completely fulfilled in the son of God the child that was born the son that was given eventually came through the Virgin Mary that with Joseph went to Bethlehem in Judea for the registration in the census that had been proclaimed by Augustus Caesar or Caesar Augustus now what all of this is coming together is that that child that was born, that son that was given, became the fulfillment of the salvation in the kingdom of God that had been handed over as a scepter to the line of Judah, that David became the first person to manifest. The scripture says, talks of him, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed, is the one who has prevailed, to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. He has prevailed to loose its seven seals. This is talking about the fullness of his power to save us. Next verse. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent out into all the earth so the child that was born the son that was given became a lamb that was sacrificed on the cross who is now who then became worthy worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll that no one was found worthy to do and the scripture says, now when he had opened the scroll, the four living creatures in verse 8, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. See the transition from the foretelling that began with Jacob that began with Jacob speaking over Judah to Isaiah chapter 9, talking about a child given, a son, a child born, a child born, a son given, and government will be upon his shoulder. And then David rising as the first king. That the first king from Judah that God gave the promise of eternal dynasty and Jesus being born as king to fulfill that in Bethlehem of, the, um, of Judah, which was, of course is the root of David. That son, Yeshua, that one that angel told Joseph, you shall give him the name Jesus for he shall save his people, eventually was crucified as the Lamb of God as a result of which he is worthy, worthy to undo the seven seals of sin, worthy to undo the seven seals of darkness, worthy to undo the seven deals and seven documents that had been written against us, that were, that were contrary to us. He nailed them to the cross and liberated us. 
So we can see that the one that was a child given, a child born and a son given, is the Savior of the world. Glory to God. So when we talk about Christmas then, is it the date or is it the child that was born? Is it the son that was given? Who as lamb was slain for our sin? Was it to save us from the seven affliction of sin and condemnation and hell? And who is worthy to be worshipped, to be praised forever? And so when we talk about Christmas, the overacting and the overriding and the greatest of all motives and interests, it's not about the dates, whether it is correct to celebrate on the 25th of December. It's not about even what it replaced in the Roman Empire, whatever pagan festivities and the, the sun god that were, had been worshipped in the time that we now have Christmas, that the celebration of Christ replaced. That's not the main thing that is at stake. The main thing that is at stake is that we are celebrating the child that was born. We are celebrating the fact that a child was born and a son was given. And that son, the government of God, the economy, the economy, the dispensation, the stewardship of God's salvation in our favor had been placed on his shoulder. He's the one who bore our grief, bore our sorrow, who took our shame and our curse to the cross, who bore our stripes so that we'll be healed. That the chastisement that has brought us peace was laid upon him. That is the reason that we celebrate Christmas. So it's not dates. It's not a pagan event that is associated with it. Nor is it the immorality and the ungodliness and the, um, the, the high magnitude of crime and, and evil that are associated with the season. That is not what matters. We as believers, we exalt and glorify God and celebrate the fact that on a particular day, on a date, in a particular week, in a particular month, in a particular season, under a particular government in Rome, a child was given, a son was born, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when we talk about Christmas, first of all, let's deal with the deceitful heresy. The deceitful heresy that is in our time. Before we talk about the heresy, let's look at the scripture because this is the season. This is the season of everyone preaching his own doctrine. This is a desperate time. This is a time of everyone having its own unique doctrine. This is a time of knowledge when people know foolishness and are honored and celebrated and followed. When people talk nonsense and have lash followership because of the currency of nonsense in our world. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let's understand something that is very basic. The scripture says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you shall by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Pay attention. Stay in that place. Stay. He said, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Keep that scripture there. Now the whole issue of Christmas is the confession of faith by believers that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Coming in the flesh means he was born in a particular day. He was born in a particular season, in a particular time. I am here sitting down here. I'm here sitting down, Patrick Henry, because I was born. I was born on a Palm Sunday on the 30th of March, 1969, it was a Palm Sunday. It was a Sunday, a Palm Sunday, and it was 30th of March. 
I'm talking with you on radio and I'm talking to you on radio. I'm sharing this with you in the flesh. There are angels in the world, there are demons in the world. We don't hear them come on radio to talk except they use a body, a flesh. The legitimacy, in other words, the right for operation on earth is the flesh. So when God said, let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion, that is Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. But in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7, God molded the dust, which is the flesh, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, that breath of life is the image and likeness of God in the flesh, which is what makes that spirit of God, that image and likeness of God, have capacity to walk the earth and to rule the earth. So if Jesus had not come in the flesh, consequences that are very, very deep. If he had not come in the flesh, number one, he will not have blood to shed. And the scripture says there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It's a life of every creature is in the blood and has been given to you at the altar for atonement. So the atonement, the blotting away, and the washing of humanity from the fall of Adam had to come through blood. But that blood had to be blood of human, but blood that was innocent. Because the one who is guilty of a crime cannot bail another who is guilty of the same crime. So God in his innocence, the pure spirit, divine, had to come in the flesh, take flesh, in order to have blood in the flesh that is completely innocent, but that is completely human. So when he died on the cross, he felt the pain that any other person could have felt because he was in the flesh. And the blood that was shed, that he said on the cross, it is finished. There is no way he will say it is finished. That means sins fully dealt with. Satan fully crushed. There is no way he will say that if that blood had not been the blood of human in order to stand in to intercede and to do the work for man that no angel could have done. And so every form of argument against Christmas in terms of significance and importance is heretical and very, very deep. Why? It is striking at the very root, the incarnation of Jesus Christ and making a case that Jesus did not come in the flesh and making a case since he did not come in the flesh, he did not shed his blood. And since he did not shed his blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Therefore, Christianity is built upon lie. And so this heresy that First John is dealing with, Gnosticism and other related heresies, they came up in the early time of the church, that Jesus just appeared, that God could not have come in the flesh, with the implication that he did not suffer pain, because God could not have suffered pain. But the attendant consequence and implication is also that he did not pay for the crime of man. That means Isaiah chapter 53, from especially verses 4 and 5, is null and void. In verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Wounded. That's the flesh. He came in the flesh, wounded in the flesh for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities bruised in the flesh. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. The punishment that has brought us peace upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. So a preacher who preaches healing and then attacks Christmas is a preacher without knowledge. Is a preacher with what I call um, spiritual myopia. A spiritual short-sightedness. And this is what heresy is all about. Heresy is not the denial of the faith or the denial of the truth of the gospel. Heresy is about picking and choosing. At the very root of heresy is picking a verse in the Bible that agrees with what you want people to know or what you want to tell yourself. And then reject every other and call every other scripture either not inspired. And that is what is happening these days. The picking of a scripture and twisting it to tell just one story 
and then the rejection of other scriptures so that it now becomes like scripture fights against itself and that is not it every form of such preaching is the heresy and that is what our time is all about the time of the outburst of heresy of people trying to make a name and importance for themselves by attacking things they have no understanding about so we are growing in a season where many believers believe going to church on 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 christmas day is a waste of time so christmas has become a a, a holiday for so many who just get away with their family and when there is healing crusade they go to church there is something about that there is something about that look at the scripture in second timothy second timothy chapter 3 verse 1 to 5 second timothy chapter 3 verse 1 to 5 but know this that in the last days perilous times will come these are the last days and these are perilous times and next verse is for men will be lovers of themselves lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy we just stay in that verse they shall be lovers of themselves if you read down the scripture talks about they shall not be lovers of god but they shall be lovers of themselves they shall not be lovers of god they shall be lovers of themselves so we now see in a christmas season many believers who just feel going to church and people are now talking about oh i have been divorced and separated from structured religion so that means it is as it is convenient to me lovers of themselves if it fits well with what i love it is okay if it does not fit well it is not okay that means if it were to be this generation that believers will have to fight for the faith in the face of the roman persecution christianity will have died about two thousand years ago because people stood for the faith and died for the faith this is a time of the rising of the remnant but why do we celebrate christmas and what is is celebrate is christmas even worthy of celebration i will not tell you that the last part of what i, I wanted to talk about i said it is remembrance i've talked about historical i've talked about the soteriological which is the spiritual which has to do with salvation let's talk about the remembrance so christmas has these three le levels the historical i have traced it the soteriological i've talked about it the salvation that the child the son brought and that if we if we play down on the importance of christmas we are negating all of this salvation so now let's talk about remembrance remembrance is all about bringing to mind israel today survives as a nation against all odds and keeps its religion the worship of yahweh in judaism intact because of remembrance god commanded as they left egypt that they should tell every generation that if they eat passover they should let their children know why they do this and god told them when you eat this passover go through this in every generation tell your children so right now among the orthodox jews on every sabbath and during all their major feasts in the family meal the father will sit down and tell the story to their children the tradition is handed over from one generation to another in remembrance talk about remembrance when we remember disaster in the past usually we recall the mood that that disaster brought we recall the pain and the experience the trauma when they do the remembrance of the holocaust when the jews mark the holocaust the remembrance and other nations of the world join them is usually a very gloomy moment with black attire and all of that it recalls the program it recalls the time that it was legitimate for the jews to be treated like animals and to be burned like flies and it usually brings horror brings pain brings shame upon humanity but when we remember 
our independence. When nations of the world re remember their independence, when South Africans will remember the release of Mandela and the, the, the inclusive government and the black majority government that he formed, it brings joy. So everything being equal, on the 1st of October, we are remembering the liberation of Nigeria from the colonial rule. And it brings, in every, every everything being equal, should bring joy to the nation, should bring hope to the nation. And so it is in spiritual matters. Jesus Christ spoke specifically at the at the table of the Last Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And Paul said, that which had been handed over to me is what I hand over to you. It is not only the Last Supper that had been handed from the early days of Christianity, other dimensions of our faith. At the time that Roman Empire was Christianized and Christmas, the celebration of the birth of Christ, replace the celebration of the birth of um or so to say of the sun god and the emergence of the sun god and all of that the celebration of that what it represents is the invoking the experience the joy the salvation the peace that the birth of christ brought so in this remembrance what do we celebrate and what is the implication of the celebration of christmas the heavens first of all celebrated Christmas. The first Christmas celebration was by angels. And angels came to tell men to celebrate. Luke's Gospel chapter 2 from verse 8 to 20. Such a long reading. I have told you today will be dedicated to Christmas. And this is a teaching service. This is, we shall still do some singing and um, worshipping. But the most important burden today have been to give a gift of knowledge hopefully that somebody records this or somebody keeps this it is a service to the church it is a gift to the church of our time why we celebrate christmas and the danger of downgrading the significance and the importance of christmas celebration luke's gospel chapter 2 from verse 8 very long reading let's attempt and just see the first christmas celebration now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. The previous verse, verse 7, talks about Mary giving birth to his, her firstborn child and, and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Then the next verse, verse 8, talks about the shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night which means this happened in the night. Next verse, verse 9. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born, you say, I bring you tidings of good tidings, good tidings, good tidings of great joy great joy joy is about celebration which will be to all people all generation for there is born to you this day so just as was born on a particular day whether the time of the day was night afternoon morning but this day so this is history in the city of david location a savior who is christ the lord and this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, listen to this one. And suddenly, after this angel proclaimed this news, great news of great joy to this shepherd. And this shepherd were told that this, this, this news was to all people. That means they were to spread it. That means... All people were to receive this generation handing over to generation. Generation handing over to generation that a child was born and a son was given. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Wow, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. So it was. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, 
that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Have you, did you see the first Christmas? And who celebrated it? The angels. Now, let's talk about the angels and Christmas. Jesus was not born for them. Jesus did not die for them. Jesus did not become flesh for them. But they knew the implication, the joy, the salvation, which will be to all people. And they showed how it should be celebrated with great joy, singing glory to God. So Christmas celebration is not glory to immorality. Christmas celebration is not glory to Roman Empire and the ancient gods of the Roman Empire. The, Romans, the, the, the Christmas celebration is not glory to kidnapping, it's not glory to fraud and crime, to accident, and to irresponsible living. It is glory to God. So the issue of not going to church on Christmas that has become what modern, intelligent, and very glorious, wonderful, wealthy Christians and middle class and upcoming young people now have as a culture. Oh, Many people attack that Christmas is not relevant and people just see that as holiday. Where is glory to God there? Where is glory to God there? So it fits into what 2 Timothy talks about. Lovers of themselves. Convenience. Personal interest. And the one who came in the flesh, born outside the inn because there was no room for him. There's still no room for him in a culture. There's still no room for him in hearts. There's still no room for him now in the preaching of modern day funky, contemporary, intelligent, and updated preachers. No room for him. No room for this ancient faith in remembrance. That is the perilous time we are living in. So the first Christmas was celebrated by angels and they say it is to all people and so when we go to church on christmas day and everything that we do around that time it is meant to bring about remembrance and to keep the remembrance so if people begin to bind this bind not immorality but people now begin to say bind the spirit of christmas let's rise against the christmas the spirit of christmas and people say these things and they don't, and people pray them because it is their G.O. We talk about let's bind the spirit of immorality and wickedness that operates in the season of Christmas. It makes some sense. But the talking about Christmas, which is about the celebration of the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation, which is the primary and the first mystery of our redemption. Because if he did not come in the flesh, he will not die on the cross and there will be no Easter and there will be no second coming. Any attempt to talk about Christmas in terms of evil is evil of unpardonable proportion. And that's why the scripture says we should not all want to be teachers because teachers will be, will be judged very harshly. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that today we, you send back the spirit of truth upon the church. The church has been called to be the foundation, the pillar of truth. And we are the salt of the earth. In Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13. And we are the light of the world. And as salt of the earth, Christmas season for believers becomes opportunity to bring flavor of purity. To bring the light of holiness to our pagan world. But not the time of attacking the very faith, the very mystery upon which we stand in our salvation. Lord, send the light of revelation. Send the light of salvation. Send the light of truth upon the church. In the name of Jesus, Lord, show mercy upon teachers, the teachers of the faith, who teach what they don't know, who teach error for cheap popularity. Lord, we ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, mercy will be given. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the child that has been born. Thank you for the son that has been given. <music>